All right, let's continue as we sing together. Most of you have heard an old hymn called Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, right? We're going to take the music this morning and we're going to put some new words to the tune. Okay, it's actually not new. This came out in 1969, but it never made its way into a lot of hymnals. I don't know why. This is a Baptist church. We are a mission-minded group of believers, and this is what we are all about. I want you to pay especially close attention to the words this morning. This is to worship, work, and witness. And so much so on your way out this morning, I made some bookmarks and put the lyrics on there. They're by the table and out in the lobby for you to pick up one on the way out and carry with you. Read over them. Don't just sing it this morning. Let's stand as we worship together. and I hope that you do. Turn with Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 15 through 20. Um, titled this morning's sermon, To Spot a False Prophet. In case you guys don't pick up on it, but uh, there is a white dot right in the middle of the PowerPoint. That's just me and my sense of humor. Uh, going along with my title, to spot a false prophet. Sometimes it's that difficult to spot a false prophet. Maybe right under our nose, but yet we don't even recognize it until somebody points it out. Well, today, uh, through the teaching of Jesus, I hope to do that for you, is help you spot a false prophet. They are all over the place. They're all over the world. They're all in churches and, of course, not in churches alike. We want to read what Jesus has to say about that. Now, as you know, we are rapidly approaching the end of the Sermon on the Mount, which, of course, means the end of our series. Now, I know that I've been challenged by uh, the teachings of Jesus, and, and my prayer is that you have as well. I hope that you have grown in your relationship with Christ through these sermons and your knowledge of the Word. Now, these next couple of passages, we have about three more sermons, including today, um, are critical to your walk with Christ. 
All right? I believe they're critical with your walk with Christ as we talk about this morning discerning false teachers in your life. Not being a false teacher, which we'll look at next week, and then in two weeks we'll conclude the entire sermon by looking at building our life on the right foundation. So just like with any speech or any sermon, usually the last several statements, the last few minutes, are some of the most important things that are being said. Now, we know that everything that Jesus says is important. Amen? It is. But I think what he shares at the end of this sermon sets the stage for us to, to, um, uh, to have a better walk with him, to carry out what it is that he has called us to do and to do it well. That's how important I believe these last three sermons are in this series. So we need to pay close attention to what Jesus is saying. So let's start. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, going through verse 20. It says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the lake of fire. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for this privilege this opportunity to be able to study your word, to preach and teach your word. God, I pray that you enlighten us today uh, with your Holy Spirit to uh, be able to discern uh, uh, false prophets, false teachers from right teachers and, and those who proclaim the word righteously. God, I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will work within us this morning. Draw us to you. Lord, may we learn more of you. But God, more importantly, we pray if there's one here today who is lost without you, we pray that today be the day of salvation. God, that they'll come, give their life to you, and be eternally changed. God, I pray that you'll bless the teaching and the preaching of your word. Lord, may you use my lips for your service. Hide me behind the cross. May you and you alone be exalted. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now our passage this morning comes on the heels of Jesus talking about the narrow way which leads to life and the broad way which leads to destruction. If you were with us last week, um, you heard that sermon. But right out of the gate here, I want you to know that false prophets or false teachers seek to broaden the path to heaven. Alright? I want you to write that down. I want you to know that false teachers seek to broaden the path to heaven. Jesus says that the way to heaven is narrow and there are few who find it. False teachers want to broaden the way. And boy, have we seen that in our day and time. Amen. We've seen it on television. We've seen it on the radio or heard it on the radio through the years. Now, I want you to check out this clip I'm about to show. Okay? Um, I think it kind of speaks exactly to what I'm talking about here. A few disclaimers before we watch this clip, though. Okay? Number one is this was recorded before HDTV. So the quality is not that great. But it's the words I want you to hear. Number two, uh, it's not meant to offend anyone in any way, shape, or form, but to enlighten us. Okay? So that we don't stand before God like these next people, uh, like the people in our next section of Scripture, saying, Lord, Lord. We did this in your name. We did that in your name. But yet he says, depart from me. We have to be able to discern between right teaching and false teaching. So this is not meant to offend. This is meant to enlighten. So show this clip. And then I'm going to follow it up with another clip. So 
Go ahead and show this clip. The panel has been discussing the spirituality and the forces of God, but I also believe that there are two forces that are here with us, that we do have our, our, our God that we can depend on, but there is also a power of darkness that we do need to be aware of. And, and that's you, where the choices begin. Do you begin. believe that, uh, that you can choose between one or the other? Most, most absolute definitely. Yeah. Now, we have given that now Marianne uh, Williamson says in her book, Return to Love, that we're always walking in the direction of one or the other. That all of your actions in life, either you're moving toward the darkness or you're moving toward the light. Right. She calls it fear and love. There's this wonderful book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which talks, it, which, which is, anyway, it's a gorilla talking, but anyway. <laughs> uh, it talks about one of the points it brings out is one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to yeah. live. That's and right. that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world, that there are millions of ways to be a then human being, and, and many ways, no, but many paths no to what you call God, that and is her path crazy. might be something else, and when she gets there, she might call it the light, but her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be on that, I mean, it, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I there could possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Why even bring them up in this whole discussion and you say there isn't only one way? There is one way and only one way and there that is through be. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because a million you of people say there there isn't. There couldn't possibly be. Because you say, you intellectualize it and say there isn't. If no. you don't believe that, you're all buying into the lie. But that makes you right. Do you think, do you think that if you, if you are somewhere on the planet... Where are you so, if you're somewhere on the planet and you never hear the name of Jesus, you never hear the name of Jesus, but yet you live with a loving heart, you lived as Jesus would have had you to live, you lived for the same purpose that Jesus came to the planet to teach us all, but you are in some remote part of the earth and you never heard the name of Jesus, you cannot get to heaven, you think? And that is covered in the scriptures, too. The People are talked about Truly. that. God knows the heart. Does God care about your heart or does God care about if you call his son Jesus? Well, you know, Oprah, God, Jesus cannot come back until that gospel is preached in the four corners of this earth. So, you know, figure it out. Okay. Okay, I can't get into a religious argument with you. It's not religion, Oprah. I can't get into a religious argument with you. John so since I gave you an example of what false teaching is, and you can pick up where the false teaching is, let me give you an example of right teaching, all right? Another video that I want to show. Um, and she does make reference to Oprah, so check out Priscilla Shire. For those of you who don't know who Priscilla Shire is, uh, she was the lead actress in the movie War Room. So we showed the movie War Room. If you watch that, then you're familiar with her. Now listen to what she has to say, which is right teaching about God the Father. So watch this video. When you feel like you can't handle the task at hand and you ask yourself, girl, who's your daddy? Because I remember when Jerry said that to me and I, I got a good look at him, I felt secure, I felt taken care of, not because of me, but because of who I belong to. And what if when you got a good look at your God, remembering who he is and that you belong to him. Listen, I think until the Lord uh, stops me from taking platforms and ministering to women, I will say this until the day that I die. Reminding myself as I do when I am quietly alone and I look myself in the mirror and say, girl, who's your daddy? You know what I tell myself? I tell myself. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He's the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He's the architect of the universe and the manager of all time. He always was, always is, always will be unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised but brought healing. He was pierced but eased pain. He was persecuted but brought freedom. He was dead and brings life. He is risen to bring power and he reigns to bring peace. The world can't understand him. Armies can't defeat him. Schools can't explain him. And leaders, they can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. Nero couldn't crush him. The new age cannot replace him. And Oprah cannot explain him away. She can't. She can't do it. You remind yourself.
himself that he is light, he is love, he is longevity, and he is the Lord. He is goodness and kindness and faithfulness, and he is God. He is holy and righteous and powerful and pure. His ways are right, his word eternal, his will unchanging, and his mind is on us. He's our savior, our guide, our peace, our joy, our comfort, our Lord, and he rules our lives. I serve him because his bond is love, his yoke is easy, his burden is light, and his goal for us is abundant life. I follow him because he's the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of all leaders. His goal is a relationship with me. He'll never leave you, never forsake you, never mislead you, never forget you, never overlook you, and never cancel your appointment in his appointment book. Never. When you fall, he'll lift you up. When you fail, he'll forgive you. When you're weak, he's strong. When you're lost, he's your way. When you're afraid, he's your courage. When you stumble, he will steady you. When you're hurt, he's going to heal you. When he's broken, when you're broken, he will mend you. When you're blind, he will lead you. When you're hungry, he will feed you. When you face trials, he's with you. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face problems, he will comfort me. When I face loss, he will provide for me. And when we face death, he will carry us all home to meet him. He is everything for everybody everywhere every time and in every way he is your God and that sisters is who you belong to amen Priscilla Shire she's definitely got it in the genes her daddy is uh, dr. Tony Evans I don't know if you're familiar with him at all but I enjoy listening uh, to her now that my friend is an accurate teaching of God the Father amen I also want to make this clear this morning as well. A false teacher is not always a person that stands behind a pulpit or claims to be a pastor or claims to be a minister. See, Jesus is not just speaking to ministers here or speaking about ministers, although that's where our minds tend to go, right? Um, a false teacher has to be a pastor or, or a minister. And so we think that we're exempt from that, that we're not possibly a false teacher. But Jesus is indeed speaking to all of us when he says this about being a false teacher or be wary of false teachers. See, a false teacher is anyone who leads anyone else away from God. Now, Today, we're going to look at who we're following. Next week, we're going to look at are we being a false teacher? Are we being uh, leading people away from God? Are we leading people to God? So, a false teacher is anyone who leads anyone else away from God. Now, let me let you in on a little secret uh, this morning. Uh, you are following someone. Or something. You are following someone or something. And the reason I throw that something in there is because there's some who follow the, the television and what they call reality television shows, right? And so that's who I want to be like. That's what I want to live like kind of thing. So some people follow things and not people. But we all follow someone. We all look up to somebody. We all have someone that we look up to. It may be a pastor. It may be a friend. It may be a mentor. You may look up to your parent, your grandparent. But we all have that person that we look up to. What we learn from or who we learn from. And since we all have those people that we look up to in this life, my question to you is, are they leading you in the right direction? That person that you look up to, are they leading you in the right direction? Are they, as Jesus says, a false prophet or false teacher? So who is it you're following and are they a false prophet or a false teacher? I know that initially you would say, of course not. They have my best interest in mind, and, and they might have. They might have your best interest in mind. But how can we know for sure? How can we know for sure they're not a false teacher? They're not leading us away from God. Well, let's look at what Jesus says here about that. How to spot a false teacher. Number one. 
Uh, you can't look at the outside clothing. How to spot a false teacher? Number one, you can't look at the outside clothing. Look at verse 15. It says, Beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Here we are again uh, talking about clothes. It's crazy how it keeps coming up in Scripture. And Jesus says that a false teacher looks just like the sheep. Looks just like the sheep, but on the inside they're ravenous wolves. Okay, uh, We must move uh, past this idea of outward appearance determines the inward person. All right? We've got to move past. Let me say this again. We've got to move past this idea that outward appearance determines the inward person. Got to get past that. Okay? If we follow or listen to people who only look the part on the outside of a good teacher, then we're setting ourselves up to be deceived. See, it's obvious that you guys didn't do this, okay? But you guys, I, I'm telling you, you didn't do this, but I have heard of churches who are looking for a guy with a certain look to be their pastor. As a matter of fact, this is a true story. I preached before a pulpit committee before I was ever a pastor. Uh, me and another guy, and I knew the other guy, we, um, we preached before this pulpit committee. And um, I got passed over, and they chose him to be the pastor, which was the right choice, okay? I was not the right guy for that church. I know that now. But when that pulpit committee uh, contacted me and told me why they didn't choose me, here's what they told me. You didn't have the right look. <laughs> I don't know what look they were looking for. Well, I do know what look they were looking for. They just told me, but I'm not going to share that with you. Um, but I didn't have what they were looking for, okay? I didn't look the part that they were hoping. And so they were, they were looking at appearance. Now, I thank God for His providence, right? Here and then. Um, but they were looking for a particular look. See, I guess it's easier to listen to a man preach if he's easy on the eyes. I don't know. Um, I apologize that I'm not that way, but... It's the word that's the most important. But how many times, church, how many times have we heard, oh man, you look like a preacher this morning. Or, oh, did you come to preach today the way you're dressed? How many times have we said that? How many times do we say that in church? We say that all the time because we have this image of what a preacher or teacher, or better yet, what a Christian should look like. And I'm telling you, and Jesus is telling you, be careful with that idea. Be careful with that image because you are susceptible to the wolves coming in in sheep clothing and deceiving you. That's what Jesus is saying. And so we got to be careful with this whole image thing that we have going on because we set ourselves up to be deceived. So be careful because a wolf can dress up like a sheep. Secondly, in order to spot a false teacher, is you can't always tell by their words. Alright? To spot a false teacher, you can't just examine their words. And I know you're thinking, this is crazy. How, how if we can't spot a false teacher by their words, then how in the world are we ever supposed to spot a false teacher? Because I thought that's what made a false teacher a false teacher. By their words. Well, let's turn over just a few pages to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, and I want to look at verse 6. I'm speaking your truth this morning, okay? I do not want any of you to be deceived. Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. You know the story. Jesus has just been baptized Holy Spirit has descended upon him. He makes his way to the wilderness and he's fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. He's at the end of the fast and who shows up? Satan. And what does he do? He begins to tempt Jesus, right? Listen to verse, four, uh, verse 6, Matthew chapter 4, verse 6. He says, And said to him, Satan speaking here, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written... 
Satan's quoting the Bible here. He says, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. So here we have Satan, who is the furthest thing from godly and godliness and holiness, right? Speaking to Jesus, who is, the, who is in the flesh God, right? And he's quoting scripture to him. Quoting scripture to Jesus. Now, in the passage that I just read, Satan is tempting Jesus, and he does it by quoting scripture. Another little secret here this morning, another little side note. Satan knows the Bible better than any of us in this room. One thing, he's had far longer to study it, right? I mean, we've only had... 40, 20, 80 years, right? He's had thousands and thousands of years to study. He knows it better than you. He knows it better than me, okay? Here's the thing. He is ready. He is prepared to bring you down with the very thing that will save you. I want you to think about that for a moment. I want you to think about this enemy. We picture him with a little red hood and horns and a pointy tail and a staff or a pitchfork or whatever. Listen, that's not him. That's not him. He is deceptive. And he's creative and deceptive. And he knows the word better than you know the word. And so he's going to try to deceive you by using the very word that can save you. What did he do with Adam and Eve? Eve said that we can't eat it. Surely God didn't tell you you couldn't. You're not going to die, right? He just kind of adds to his sprinkles a little bit, puts his own spin on it, trying to fulfill this prophecy that wasn't supposed to be fulfilled right there. So he is prepared to bring you down. The enemy is prepared to bring you down with the very thing that can save you. Therefore, it is of the utmost importance, church, that we be in the Word and in tune with the Holy Spirit. John commands us in 1 John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, to test the spirits. And here's the thing, if you're not walking with God, and you don't have a relationship with God, you, you can't test the spirits. You won't be able to tell one spirit from the next spirit. You won't be able to tell if it's a false teacher or a right teacher. Therefore, you're probably going to follow whoever. But John commands us to test the spirits. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Think about it. There are men who stand in the pulpit and preach straight from the Bible. I mean, they read the Bible, they preach from the Bible, but they don't preach all that is in the Bible. They like to preach the feel-good stuff, but not the whole truth. There are preachers who have made a career at not preaching about the suffering. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, and I know that I'm not, the Bible says that, that we will suffer because Jesus suffered. As a matter of fact, we're going to suffer for His sake. We're going to have trials and tribulations in this world. We ought to know that. If you're a believer, you ought to expect that. So when they come, you count it all joy, as James writes. Because we know that it's coming. So pastors, they don't preach that. They don't preach that we'll suffer because Christ suffered. They, want to preach on, they don't want to preach on hell because that's scary. That's scary stuff. They don't want to preach that God is just and righteous. They only want to say that God is love. Let me tell you, God is love, but He is also just and He is also righteous. That God does love sinners at the same time He hates sinners. What? How does that happen? How can God love sinners and hate sinners at the same time. You know what we call it? We call it the cross. Amen? Because at the cross of Jesus, God showed His love for sinners at the same time He showed His hatred for sin. By pouring out the wrath upon Jesus. And Jesus, like I said last week, became sin. Who knew no sin. That we might become His righteousness. So you don't have preachers preaching that. You don't have preachers preaching that God is just, that God is righteous, that there is a hell, that we are called to suffer, that we are called to be persecuted. 
I mean, there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, and I'm not trying to just focus on this stuff that's hard. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good stuff in the Bible, and I like to preach the good stuff. But there are some hard stuff in the Bible, too. There's some hard stuff. I mean, what do you do with the passages in the Old Testament where God commands the Israelites to go and utterly destroy a whole town, a whole village? What do you do with that? You know what we do with that in the church? We ignore it. And we don't have an answer for it. We should have an answer for it, but we're not in the Word enough, so we don't have an answer for it. So we ignore it. But here's the thing I want you to see, church, is the world's not ignoring it. The world's not. They're asking those questions. They're asking, okay, if your God is a God of love, then why would He have these people destroy these other people? And we sit back and we're like, I, I just know that I love Jesus. I know that I was baptized. I, I don't really have that answer. It's because we're not in the Word. We're not studying the Bible. We're not hearing the truth preached. The world's asking those hard questions. The world, atheists, agnostics, they're asking these questions. Are we ready to answer those questions? You can't always tell a false prophet, a false teacher by what they say because you have preachers who will preach all the good stuff all day long and never hit on them, not speak the whole truth. You can't always tell a false teacher by their words or by their looks. So then how are we supposed to spot a false teacher? How are we supposed to spot a false teacher? You spot a false teacher by number three, by their fruit. By their fruit. Fruit. That's such a generic answer, right? Fruit, what, what do we mean by that? Well, let's look at verses 16 through 20. And I know that we could probably spend a whole month just preaching on this passage of Scripture. But we're not going to do that. We're going to wrap it up today. Verse 16, it says, You will know them by their fruits. Do men, um, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Pick up on that reference yourself. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. You can't look at how they dress, their outward appearance. You can't tell by their speech whether they're false teachers or not. You can only tell and spot a false teacher by their fruits. Well, what does that mean? I mean? None of us has got lemons and apples growing off of us, right? So what does that mean? How do we tell um, by their fruits? Well, you may be familiar, and I hope that you are, with Galatians chapter 5. Starting in verse 16, um, it starts with the fruits of the flesh, right? Bad fruit. In verse 22, we get the fruit of the Spirit. All right, good fruit. So Galatians chapter 5, 16 through 23, you'll find that. Uh, write that down. Go home, study that. You want to know what good fruit is, what bad fruit is? Galatians 5, 16 through 23. But I think it's safe to say that what Jesus is saying here in this parable of the good tree and the bad tree is that a good tree produces love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, Faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, self-control as found in Galatians chapter 5 verse 22 through 23. And so when you hear someone or follow someone, that person that you seek counsel from, you look for these things. You look, are they loving? Are, are they or do they possess joy? What about peace? Are they at peace? Long-suffering, what does that mean? Patient. Kindness. Are they kind? Are they good people? Faithfulness. Are they faithful to their family, to the church, to their friends, to their job? To, are they faithful? Gentleness. And then self-control. These are the fruits of the Spirit. These are uh, the fruits of people that you ought to follow in life. 
So I ask you, does the person you follow, the person you take counsel from, the person you listen, expound the word, produce these fruits? A true teacher, a right leader in life is one who will show love and joy and peace and long-suffering, which is patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So who is it that you look to? Do they possess these things? In preparation for next week, do you possess those traits? Do you possess those fruit? So in closing this morning, John tells us to test the Spirit so that we'll not be deceived. Check out the fruit of those you follow and take counsel from and know that they are true teachers and live the Word of God. And so as a preacher of the Word, as a teacher of the Word, I would be doing you a huge injustice if I did not tell you that there is only one way to heaven. There is only one way to heaven. And Jesus says in John 14 verse 6 that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father. No one gets to heaven except through Him. Except through Jesus. And so if you've been trying to get to heaven by being good, by coming to church, by giving money to the church, and never by the way of Jesus, then you're being deceived into thinking you're ever going to make it to heaven because you're not going to make it. The only way is to come to Jesus by faith, right? To come to Jesus by the way of the cross, having your sins dealt with at the cross. Colossians says, nailing them to the cross. That's the only way. That's the only way to heaven. There is no other way. doesn't matter if you're seeking light or goodness or anything else. The only way to God, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ and His death upon the cross. So if you have never come to Jesus, you've never been saved by the way of the cross, then I invite you to step out during our invitation. Come forward. Allow me to introduce you to my Savior, to your Savior, which is Jesus Christ.